Welcome to this video. My name's Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln in England. And in this video, I wanted to have a look at one of the possible routes for giant planet formation. There's a few different ones. There's the core accretion one, which I did a different video on. And this one is more of a rarer route, but is called disk fragmentation, where you get a local gravitational collapse of a disk around a young star as they're forming and then you can get a giant planet forming that particular way. And that's what I'm going to have a look at in this particular video. So before we do that, let's just recap on what giant planets are, really. Well, giant planets are loosely defined as having a mass greater than 0.1 times the mass of Jupiter or 30 times the mass of Earth. Now, actually, using that particular criteria there, we only really have Jupiter and Saturn in our own system. Neptune and Uranus are kind of less than that, but they're still big planets. They are kind of, well, they're ice giants. They are kind of sit in a slightly different category, really, to Jupiter and Saturn, which, again, I've done a different video on, which you can check out. So the giant planets, typically you're looking like Jupiter's daughter size, Saturn, but anything more than 0.1 times Jupiter would loosely be classified as well. So how do they actually form? Well, the general idea of how planets form is that they form in a protoplanetary disk around a young star. So as stars are still forming, they collapse from a cloud of gas. That cloud of gas flattens to a disk-like shape and the planets form in that disk whilst the young star is still forming. When that star has formed and it's then an actual star and not a protostar, it blows away all of that gas and leaves behind the planets and any other objects that are formed there. So actually the planets have a finite window to actually grow in this gas disk before they actually stop forming basically or stop growing. Now actually there are um, other ways in which planets can form without a star but we're going to, not going to look at that in this video. So two main models then for giant planet formation and this actually assumes that you've already got terrestrial planets there. So actually so there are two main models for giant planet formation. You've got the core accretion model which I did a different video on and you have the disk instability model so, or disk fragmentation. That's the one we're going to have a look at with this one and the core accretion model basically planets form by slowly accumulating dust and gas in, in the actual disk itself it takes a lot longer whereas the instability model you have a localized collapse of the of the disk and it's a very rapid process and you can form a planet quite quickly as opposed to very slowly growing it over time so in the disk instability model the formation of the planets occurs kind of in a single step, quite rapidly actually, and you get the star forming in the centre of this disk, and then you can get one of a giant planet forming on the outer pod or further out really. And what happens there is the disk itself becomes gravitationally unstable, and it, you get a localised collapse, and then you get a, a planet forming. And interestingly, if you've got a a bigger disk or a, a, a larger gravitational instability, you can actually get a binary star system forming in exactly the same manner, actually. But on a smaller scale, then you can get a giant planet forming, basically. So the core accretion model then is sometimes referred to as bottom up because you're growing from smaller objects that then accumulate each other. They then grow and grow from the collection of, of smaller objects and medium sized objects. So it's classified as bottom up. And the disk instability model is referred to as top down because it's you basically going straight from the disk to a planet without all of those steps in between. Again, that's why it's kind of faster, really. So what are the benefits of the disk instability model or of a fragmentation of that disk compared to the core accretion model? Well, it actually it bypasses some uncertainties and barriers in the core accretion model where you actually get the accumulation of solids. So when you get to certain sizes, those particles, they actually grow less efficient. So for example, at a certain size, particles, instead of sticking to one another, they will actually bounce off each other. Or you get a fragmentation, they hit each other so hard that they actually fragmentate or fragment each other. And that actually is a bit of a barrier in the growth. And there's large uncertainties there on how long that takes, how you actually overcome that barrier so you can grow to the planet. In the time frames we need before the star actually becomes a star or the first star becomes a star um, you need longer time frames as we just mentioned and this can be a hundred years for disk fragmentation compared to millions of years 
So again, it just points out that this is actually a very fast process to form a planet, which can overcome these limitations of the much slower core accretion model. Now, one downside is that the giant planets in the solar system were thought to have solid cores. That's not necessarily what we understand right now, but we assume that they've got some kind of quite dense solid cores. And in the instability model, that's not necessarily the case because they haven't grown from a terrestrial planet. Because in the core accretion model, you, you assume that the terrestrial planet and the giant planet formation is, is the same up to a certain point. So you get a rocky core, and then that rocky core is able to get a very large gas envelope around it. So they form in the same way up to that point, whereas the instability model is not the same. You get a, a gravitational collapse of that, that gaseous disk, basically. So it's become it, it was less favorable when it was for an initially kind of proposed. However, now that we're finding lots and lots of planets around stars, it's quite likely that it is actually a combination of these two. So some of them can form through core accretion and actually maybe a small percentage of them actually do form from the disk fragmentation or instability model instead. So it's not just that one or the other is right, it could be a combination of both. So unlike the core accretion model, the instability occurs rapidly in a single step, as we know. And again, that's kind of a model there showing how it might occur. So that's actually this, the disk surface density there. And you can see you've got two local collapses, I suppose, in that disk where you're going to get giant planets forming um, kind of opposite each other there. So then accretion disks are known to be unstable at large radiuses. So if you go further away from the star, they actually become unstable. And if you've got a massive disk, so H here is actually the height or the thickness of the disk. If it's very thin and it's a very massive disk, then it's going to be unstable when it's further away from the star. And why does that occur? Well, if we have a look at the tumor parameter, this actually is the criteria for the stability of a differentially rotating disk to gravitational flap. What does that actually mean? Well, if it's a Keplerian disk, which means that it is orbiting around the star relative to the distance or yeah, related to the distance it is from the star, which means that it gets slower and slower the further away that it is, a bit like how the planets further away in the solar system orbit slower, and that gives you a differentially rotating disk. And the further away that you are, it's going to be going slower. And then you have the self-gravity of that disk, which can overcome that. And that happens further away from the actual star. And this needs to be, but this two more parameter, this Q, needs to be less than one for it to become gravitationally unstable for a collapse, basically. So... For the equation here, you've got like the speed of sound in the in the gas, you've got the Keplerian angular velocity, which again that decreases the further away from the star that you get at larger radiuses. You've then also got the disk surface density. So again, if we're going to get gravitational collapse further out, then that means the Keplerian angular velocity is going to be lower. And even if the disk surface density doesn't increase or decrease, you can see why it would get more unstable further away from the star and also suggest that a massive disk or one with a large surface density would also be unstable as well. So yeah, if you're less than one, you're gonna be unstable to gravitational collapse and then you get a planet forming or a clump, which can then form a planet. If it's greater than one, then that disk is actually stable to gravitational collapse. Um, that shearing force can overcome the self-gravity at that point and it actually won't collapse. And that generally occurs quite close into the star. So it's not going to be unstable close to the star, but it would typically have to happen further out. Now, it could be that there are two conditions that exist in a disk around a star, or stability, basically. It could be that the whole disk is unstable. And in that scenario there, you're going to get lots of gravitational instabilities occur, not just a single fragmentation of the disk. Or it could be that the disk is unstable at a particular point. There could be a, a, a single point or a couple of points in that disk where it actually goes below that tumor parameter stability criteria and you get a localized collapse instability point. And that's probably more applicable for creating, you know, one 
or two giant planets in a disk a bit further out. So estimates of the models then suggest that fragmentation only occurs in massive disks and also when they're young. Now, the reason why they're going to be quite young is that that material in the disk is continuously falling onto the star. It's also slowly growing into other planets and clumps within, within the actual disk itself, and that depletes the disk. So it has to be when the disk still has a lot of material there, which happens early on. So again, a massive disk, really. So disk fragmentation typically would expect it to occur early on after the actual initial disk had been formed. Now, if we actually compare that to our solar system, so the minimum mass solar nebula gives a surface density for our disk around the sun when we were forming, when our solar system was forming. And in order for disk fragmentation to occur to actually create a giant planet, surface density needs to be two orders of magnitude greater than what we would have had for the solar system. So again, that's, that's really highlighting and pointing out that this has to be a massive disk and it's not going to be a common occurrence. The massive disks are probably going to be less, um, they're going to be less of them around than there will be of things like the solar system or, or lower mass stars. So again, this is only going to be a rare occurrence. Now, this was a simulation that had a disk mass of about 0.13 solar masses around a one solar mass star. And it becomes unstable to fragmentation beyond seven and a half AU. Now, that's astronomical units, and that's approximately between Jupiter and Saturn, where we are in our current solar system. And there's two regimes there. You can see you've got a stable one and an unstable. And again, it occurs further out. It doesn't happen in, and you can see, the disk is actually quite stable to gravitational collapse quite close in, and specifically, you know, fairly close to where the Earth's orbit would be. There's no chance of a fragmentation event occurring there from these simulations. Now, as this disk becomes unstable, it's going to generate these spiral shocks, like kind of spiral waves in the actual disk itself. And again, you can see they're occurring in the outer part of the disk, not the inner part. Now, these actually heat the disk locally, and this can cause the tumor parameter Q to increase which then actually stabilizes the disk. And what you find is that the surface density and the temperature hover around values that would give a Q value of one. So it actually becomes stable again. And this is known as a self-regulating disk. So this is actually a simulation of a disk by Daniel Price. And on the right-hand side, you've actually got the tumor parameter as a function of radius as well. And you can see as those spiral shocks actually form, it self-regulates and it keeps that Q value above one. So in this particular disk here, you don't get a fragmentation or a gravitational instability occur in this disk. Now, why is this occurring? Well, not necessarily why is this occurring, but this relates to the temperature of the actual disk. So fragmentation is only going to occur if the cooling is quite fast. So if that disk can essentially dissipate that, that heat that's generated quite quickly, faster than, than some critical value, then the Q value does drop below one and then it will fragment. So it all depends how fast that disk actually cools down. So here you go. Same thing really, this actually, this time round, you've got fast cooling and you can see you've got instabilities occurring there compared to the other one, which was self-regulating. And this one, you've got quite a few as opposed to a, a, a single fragmentation occurring there. So thank you for watching and if you enjoy then do check out some of the other videos.